the 1970s and 80s, California's highways served as the hunting ground for multiple serial killers. Dozens would lose their lives to the depraved killers that stalked the roadways of the Golden State. One of these vicious monsters claimed the lives of 21 young men and boys, sometimes with the help of vicious accomplices. The victims were put through a horrific ordeal of torture and abuse before their deaths, all for the depraved pleasure of the monster. William Bonin, the Freeway Killer William Bonin was born to a dysfunctional family in the year 1947. He had an older and younger brother, and both of his parents were alcoholics. His father was a bitter World War II veteran who beat his children and blew the family money gambling. Bonin's mother was also a gambler, but toward her children, she was controlling and bipolar. The family did not stay together for long. In 1953, when William Bonin was only six years old, his mother put him and his younger brother in the St. Joseph Convent. It was a facility known for abuse, which included beatings and children having their head held under water in toilets. William Bonin would remain in the convent until 1956, when he left to rejoin his family. Despite the staff's violence, Bonin was said to have adjusted well to life in the convent, but he faced adversities in other ways during his time there. In later years, he refused to speak of the abuse he faced from the staff, but did mention being assaulted by older boys. In one case, he gave in and let himself be used out of fear, but he spoke as if it was not a rare scenario that he endured. When he was home, the neglect of his parents was evident to their neighbors. They described how he was always dirty and starving. They gave him food and clothes out of pity. Those who went to school with him described him in much the same way and said that he spent his time as a poor and unhappy loner. To make matters worse, when the Bonin parents did have someone to watch their kids, it was often their maternal grandfather who was a convicted child molester. He had abused their mother when she was a child and she suspected that he was doing the same to her boys, but still she left them with him. It was not a shock to anyone when William Bonin began to get in trouble with the law. His first known arrest came in 1957, when he was caught stealing license plates off cars. After a series of minor offenses, Bonin was sent to a juvenile detention facility. At the detention center, he was once again abused. One of the counselors of the jail began assaulting Bonin when he should have been helping him. This time, the abuse seemed to have had an effect on the youth. After he got home, it is reported that he began touching his younger brother inappropriately. The family moved to California after gambling debts piled up and forced the foreclosure of their home in Connecticut. They rented a small house in Downey, California, and Bonin attended North High School. Like many who grew up to become serial killers, he was rejected by his peers. The situation at home became more difficult for William when he realized that he was not only attracted to other men, but to young boys. His mother did not accept her son's inclination, and it caused a lot of friction between them. She sometimes kicked him out of the house, although she denied all the allegations that he had molested children in their neighborhood. After graduating from high school, William Bonin got engaged to a young woman and also joined the military at his mother's insistence. He spent three years in the Air Force and served in Vietnam. He was awarded medals for his deeds, which included a selfless rescue of a wounded fellow airman. While in Vietnam, in addition to having relations with both men and women, he also later admitted to assaulting two men under his command at gunpoint during the Tet Offensive. He was able to avoid these deeds coming out and received an honorable discharge in 1968. However, when he returned home, Bonin discovered that the life he had prepared before going to Vietnam had fallen apart. His fiancée had had his son, but also gotten engaged to another man while he was gone. This led William returning to live with his mother, who continued belittling and emasculating her son. Almost immediately, Bonin began engaging in criminal behavior. In November of 1968, barely a month since he got home, he began abusing young boys he came across. He kidnapped a 14-year-old hitchhiker named David McVicker. Once Bonin had McVicker in his vehicle, he handcuffed and beat him, then assaulted him. He repeated this process several times with other teenagers until he was interrupted by police when he lured a 16-year-old into the back of his van and handcuffed him. He was arrested and charged with a variety of crimes related to the five kids that he had kidnapped and abused. He pled guilty and was sent to a Tascadero State Hospital. In court, it was revealed that he had tortured his victims in a variety of ways, including beating, strangling, and squeezing their groins. While incarcerated, 
Bonin found ways to entertain himself when he was not in therapy or being tested. He was found to have an IQ of 121 and a variety of psychological disorders, including antisocial personality disorder. Evidence of the abuse he had suffered was also discovered. Bonin had heavy scarring on his buttocks and head. He told doctors that he did not know how he got the scars. No matter the source, it was further proof of extreme abuse suffered in his formative years. Some of his statements in group therapy sessions would reveal his future intentions. Bonin said that he would kill future victims to avoid being arrested again. He also regularly assaulted other mentally ill inmates, which led to him being sent to prison after two years of treatment. His time in prison was brief considering his crimes. While inside, Bonin volunteered for treatment programs and also helped with a fundraiser for another prisoner. On June 11, 1974, he was deemed to no longer pose a threat to society, and he was released. He moved into an apartment that was only a mile away from his parents' home and began to ingratiate himself with the teenagers in the area. Bonin bought them alcohol and let them party in his home, much like the serial killer Dean Coral did in Houston, Texas. During this time, he held a variety of jobs, but none for very long. He also met two men, Everett Frazier and Vernon Butts, Vernon would be one of his accomplices in the murders to follow. Vernon Butts was a strange individual that dabbled in the occult and kept multiple coffins in his apartment. He had spent time in jail for crimes such as arson and burglary. Soon after meeting him, Bonin suggested that the two assault and murder a hitchhiker. They put their plan into action on the 28th of May, 1979. 13-year-old Thomas Glenn Lundgren told his friends that a man was going to photograph him at the local skate park for a magazine. He left his home in Rosita around 11 in the morning, and only hours later his body was discovered in Agora, California. The violence inflicted on Lundgren was horrific. He was only wearing his shoes and shirt when he was found. His head and face had been bludgeoned, fracturing his skull. His throat was cut, and he had been stabbed repeatedly in the chest and abdomen. The killers had also sliced off his genitals, which were found along with his pants in a nearby field. Despite all the damage, the cause of death was still found to be strangling. In August of 1979, Bonin was once again in police custody. He had molested a 17-year-old and being on parole, likely expected to be on his way back to prison. However, due to a paperwork error, Bonin was released after a brief stay at the Orange County Jail and given a court date. When Everett Fraser picked him up, Bonin said that this would never happen again, which likely was taken to mean that he would not commit the crime again. But what Bonin truly meant was that he would not leave future victims alive to be able to report him. Just a month after the first murder, Bonin and Vernon Butts were once again on the prowl. On August 4, 1979, they snatched 17-year-old Mark Shelton off the street near his Westminster home. Neighbors reported hearing screams around the time he was taken. Shelton was put through a series of horrific tortures, including being violated with sharp objects which resulted in his death. When they were done, the killers dumped his body in San Bernardino County. The very next day, the vicious creatures were in search of another victim. Marcus Grabs was a 17-year-old visiting from what was at the time West Germany and had been hitchhiking along the Pacific Coast Highway. Grabs was tied up with cord and wire and beaten and assaulted by Bonin while Butts drove the van back to Bonin's home. Once there, the abuse continued. The boy was then strangled before he was stabbed almost 80 times and his body dumped in Malibu Creek where it was found the next morning. The next victim was never identified. He was murdered on August 20th of 1979 and the body was discarded in Los Angeles. Bonin and his accomplice were seemingly insatiable and another boy would lose his life before the month ended. On the 27th of August, Bonin and Butts kidnapped 15-year-old Donald Ray Hyden from Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood. He was bound and beaten and then stabbed in the neck and groin before they killed him using ligature strangulation. On September 9, 1979, 17-year-old David Louis Murillo was riding his bike to a movie theater when he was abducted. Once Bonin and Butts had him, they drove to a secluded area where he was tied up and abused before he was beaten with a tire iron and strangled. They dumped his nude body out of the van along the side of Highway 101. Just over a week later, an 18-year-old named Robert Christopher Weirostek was murdered. 
He had been taken off the street of Newport Beach as he rode his bike to his job at a grocery store. His body was found on September 27th, discarded on the side of Interstate 10. On November 1st, Bonin and his accomplice Vernon Butts killed another young man who was never identified. Investigators put the victim's age between 15 and 27 and between 5 foot 1 and 5 foot 6. The killers beat him severely and stuck an ice pick into his nostrils and ears. It is believed that the damage done with the ice pick was done after the victim had been strangled to death. The body was then dumped along Route 99 outside of Bakersfield, California. A 17-year-old named Frank Dennis Fox fell prey to the killers on November 30th of 1979. When his body was found two days later, east of San Juan Capistrano, it showed signs of extreme violence. Fox had been beaten severely in the face and head and had ligature marks on his wrist and ankles from where he had been tied up. Went to Long Beach next in their search for victims, just weeks after the murder of Dennis Fox. John Frederick Kilpatrick was a 15-year-old who had gone out to spend some time with friends when he never returned home. Due to domestic issues between him and his parents, he was not reported missing until February of 1980. His body was found on December 13th of 1979, but was not identified until the following August. Michael Francis McDonald was a 16-year-old boy who lived in Ontario, California. He disappeared on January 1st of 1980, and only two days later, his body was discovered along Highway 71 in San Bernardino County. Michael McDonald was not identified until late March. On February 3rd, Bonin had a new assistant in his depraved acts of brutality. Gregory Miley. 18-year-old Miley was originally from Texas and was said to be a bit of a drifter. The pair picked up 15-year-old Charles Miranda as he was hitchhiking. Miley reported that the young man engaged in consensual activities with Bonin, who then quietly told Miley that this kid's gonna die. According to Miley, he asked Bonin why couldn't they just let him go, and the killer replied that Miranda could identify them in their vehicle. They took Miranda's wallet and then tied him up and beat him. Bonin assaulted him and Miley violated him with foreign objects. When the creatures were done, they used the boy's shirt and a tire iron to strangle him to death. His body was then dumped in an alley of Los Angeles. The two were not done for the day. Upon Bonin's urging, they drove to Huntington Beach. They came across one of their youngest victims, 12-year-old James McCabe. The boy had been waiting at a bus stop on his way to Disneyland. The disgusting killers enticed James McCabe into their van with the promise of a ride to Disneyland and marijuana. Bonin climbed into the back of the van and beat the boy into submission before tying him up. Miley then drove around for quite some time as Bonin assaulted McCabe and beat him with a tire iron. Eventually Miley parked and joined in on the beating. Bonin would eventually use the tire iron to tighten McCabe's shirt around his neck, killing him. Then they dumped the body in a dumpster in Walnut City. McCabe's body was found three days later, bruised and battered with a fractured skull. After the murder of James McCabe, there was an interruption to the killings. Once again, Bonin was in legal trouble. He was jailed for a parole violation and spent a month in the Orange County Jail. Bonin was released on March 4, 1980. Barely more than a week after he was let out of jail, on March 14, Bonin was at it again. He picked up 18-year-old Ronald Gatlin. After Bonin assaulted the young man, he beat him and stabbed him with an ice pick repeatedly in the ears and neck. The body of Gatlin was found in an industrial area in Duarte, California. On March 21, 1980, there was another double event. The first to be murdered that day was 14-year-old Glenn Norman Barker. The boy had been hitchhiking despite warnings from his parents. He was burned with cigarettes, beaten, assaulted, and violated with various objects. He was finally killed via ligature strangulation. The second victim on the 21st of March was 15-year-old Russell Rue. He had been waiting at a bus stop for a ride to work when Bonin lured him into the van. It is reported that the abuse of Rue lasted eight hours. He was beaten and assaulted before he was strangled to death, and his body was dumped in Cleveland National Forest. Both bodies were discovered after two days with extensive bruising and ligature marks on the wrist, ankles, and neck from where they had been restrained and strangled. In mid-March of 1980, Bonin met a 17-year-old named William Ray Pugh at one of Everett Fraser's parties. He offered him a ride home and almost immediately began propositioning him. 
When Pew attempted to exit the vehicle at a stoplight, Bonin grabbed him and held him down in the passenger seat. He told Pew how he liked to abduct and kill hitchhikers. Bonin said that he used their t-shirts to strangle victims after tying them up. He stated that if you want to kill somebody, you should make a plan and find a place to dump the body before you even pick a victim. He also told Pew that the reason he would not kill him was because they had been seen leaving the party together. Soon after that encounter, Pew was assisting Bonin in murder. On the 24th of March, 1980, they went together to Los Angeles and abducted 15-year-old runaway, Harry Todd Turner. They lured Turner into the van with promises of cash. They quickly restrained and assaulted the youth. Bonin instructed Pew to beat him up after biting into the groin of Turner. Then they strangled him using a t-shirt and tire iron. When Turner's body was found, his skull was fractured like the prior victims and his body was mutilated. Somehow, despite further arrests and parole violations, William Bonin had his parole discharged on April 10, 1980. This meant he was free to continue his murderous rampage without having a parole officer checking in on him. Soon after being released from parole, Bonin was on the hunt once again. He came across Stephen John Wood, a 16-year-old acquaintance who willingly climbed into his van. After beating and strangling the youth, Bonin left his body in the van as he went to a job interview and then had some pizza until the sun went down and he could safely dispose of the body in a Long Beach alley. On the 29th of April, 1980, William Bonin picked up 19-year-old Darren Kendrick outside of the supermarket where he worked. He took him to Vernon Butt's apartment under the guise of selling him drugs. Once there, the three sat on the couch listening to music. When Bonin propositioned the young man, Kendrick tried to run but was overpowered by his two captors. The pair then engaged in the same abuse that they had perpetuated against so many other victims. After a while, Bonin had his accomplice hold Kendrick's mouth open as he poured a potent acid down his throat. Prior to this, Kendrick had been fighting his attackers, but this subdued him. As he began to lose consciousness, Bonin began to strangle him and Butt stabbed an ice pick into his ear, severing his spinal cord. When Kendrick's body was found, dumped behind a warehouse, the ice pick was still in his ear. Lawrence Sharp was killed on May 12, 1980. The 17-year-old had been hanging around with Bonin until the killer grew tired of his presence. As with prior victims, Sharp was beaten severely and strangled with a rope or cord and then dumped behind a gas station. A week later, on May 19th, Bonin asked Butts to accompany him to hunt for another victim. However, on this occasion, Vernon refused to accompany him, and the killer went alone and kidnapped a 14-year-old named Sean King from a bus stop in Downey, California. After assaulting and strangling him, Bonin dumped the body in Live Oak Canyon before returning to brag of the killing to Butts. By this time, the police of the various jurisdictions where the bodies had been found formed a task force. Gay rights activists had also put together a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the killer. There was also a lot of media attention on the slayings, and the reporting served as entertainment for Bonin and his accomplices. On the 28th of May, 1980, William Pugh was in custody for auto theft. After overhearing police discuss the killings, he confided that he had heard Bonin discussing the exact same method of murder. Obscuring the fact that he had assisted the killer, Pugh gave a detailed statement to police which led to a deeper investigation into William Bonin. As Pew was talking with police, Bonin was recruiting a new accomplice. 18-year-old James Michael Monroe was homeless after leaving his parents' house in Michigan to go to California. The money he had brought with him was stolen, and he was living on the streets of Hollywood, earning money as a prostitute. After living a short while with Bonin, the killer confided in him that he wanted Monroe to join him in abducting and murdering a hitchhiker. Meanwhile, police were closing in on William Bonin. They began surveillance on him only hours before he dumped another body. On June 2nd, Bonin and Monroe picked up an 18-year-old named Stephen J. Wells as he waited at a bus stop. Bonin engaged in consensual activities with him in the back of the van and also in Bonin's parents' bed. Later that night, the killer convinced Wells to let himself be tied up and return for $200. Once Wells was restrained, the two began to beat the youth and took the money out of his wallet. Bonin told Wells they were going to kill him and leave his body on a bench before strangling him using the same t-shirt and tire iron method that he had implemented with many other victims. 
Monroe and Bonin loaded the body into a cardboard box and put it in their van. They then drove to Vernon Butt's apartment to gloat over the murder. Butts poked at the body and then congratulated Bonin. They discussed where they could dump it and settled on an out-of-business gas station. The body was left between a fence and a truck at a Huntington Beach gas station, where it would be discovered hours later. Despite the police surveillance beginning hours prior to the disposal of Wells' remains, they missed this act of inhuman indifference. However, after following the killer, they soon found more evidence of the sinister acts of William Bonin. On June 11, 1980, police watched as Bonin drove through Hollywood, attempting to lure in victims. The first five refused to enter the van, but 17-year-old Harold Eugene Tate got in and the two drove off. When the police later approached the parked vehicle, they heard screams and banging coming from within, so the plainclothes officers forced their way into the van. Inside, they found Bonin and the bound teenager, and the killer was arrested. Soon, the freeway killer's web of murder began to unravel. Monroe, who had been working with Bonin, became concerned when he did not show up for work. This turned to panic when they were informed of his arrest. Monroe stole a car and drove back to Michigan, where he stayed with a friend until he was arrested in connection with the murders. After the arrest of Bonin, the police began to sift through the contents of his van. Inside, they found knives, ropes, cords, pliers, wire clothes hangers, and the much-used tire iron. The door handles had also been removed from the passenger side and back doors, preventing victims from escaping. Large blood stains were also discovered in both the van and Bonin's residence. In the glove box was a scrapbook filled with articles related to the freeway killer murders. After a period of denial, Bonin eventually confessed to the murders. He told them that it was not out of empathy for his victims' families, but because he knew he would be given a hamburger on the way to showing the police the dump site of Sean King. Over the next several days, Bonin gave detailed accounts of 21 murders. He never expressed remorse and only mentioned how embarrassed he was that he had been caught. Bonin also readily gave up his accomplices, Vernon Butts, James Monroe, Gregory Miley, and William Pugh. There was enough evidence to charge Bonin with 16 counts of murder, 11 counts of robbery, and some other charges related to the abuse he inflicted on his victims. A warrant was issued for Vernon Butt's apartment, and within, police found evidence connecting him to several of the murders. He was charged with six counts of murder and three counts of robbery. Butts would soon admit to his involvement, but claimed it was out of fear of Bonin. Monroe was arrested on July 31, 1980, in Port Huron, Michigan, and extradited to California for the murder of Stephen Wells. Gregory Miley was arrested in Texas on August 22nd and charged with two murders and sent to California. He initially pled innocent, but after speaking of his involvement on a recorded phone call, he changed his plea to guilty. More deaths would still occur related to the freeway killings. On January 11, 1980, Vernon Butts hung himself in his cell after four unsuccessful suicide attempts in the preceding weeks. Miley and Monroe agreed to testify against Bonin in return for life sentences and to avoid the death penalty. William Pugh pled guilty to one count of involuntary manslaughter and also agreed to testify. He would only receive a six-year prison sentence. William Bonin's trial began on November 5, 1981. His attorneys tried to argue that the abuse he had endured as a child was a mitigating factor. However, this was not enough to counter the extreme violence recounted in the testimony of his accomplices and the details that Bonin had spoken of in an interview with a reporter. On March 12, 1982, he was officially sentenced to death, and when he was tried in the other jurisdictions, this sentence was repeated. On San Quentin's death row, Bonin wrote short stories and made artwork. He also corresponded with the families of some of his victims and was friendly with fellow serial killer Lawrence Pliers Bittaker. He was executed by lethal injection on February 26, 1996. Despite avoiding the death penalty, Gregory Miley would still die as a result of his involvement in the depraved freeway killings. In 2016, he was beaten to death by another inmate at Meal Creek State Prison. Monroe has come up for parole multiple times, but so far he has been denied. William Pugh only served four of the six years that he was sentenced to and was released in 1985.